When I taught preaching to young seminarians, I used to tell them that a preacher should think clearly, feel deeply, and cause his hearers to do the same. Today I hope that we do indeed think clearly, but I also hope that we feel deeply. If you are not touched emotionally today, it may be because you have really developed a hard heart, maybe because of some bad experiences. Because today's message in one respect is very difficult. It is intended to touch the emotions, but it's intended to do more than that, to show us the grace of God in the midst of the most awful devastation that we could describe. So at the end of the message, you will be given hope, no matter who you are, no matter what your problems are. You may be a drug addict. You may be going through a time of depression. I promise you hope, but first of all, we have to look at a few texts. You know, there are different reasons why it is that um, cities can be destroyed. One reason may be because of natural disasters. We think immediately of Katrina. We think of New Orleans being destroyed largely. We think, for example, of Tuscaloosa and even Washington in the middle of the state of Illinois, where a tornado comes and basically destroys a town. We can also think of times when cities are destroyed because of war. When Rebecca and I were in Belarus, we took a trip out to what is known as Ketchian. Ketchian, I wish I could take all of you to it, is a place devoted to the destruction that took place under the Nazis. What happened is the Nazis came and in retaliation, they decided to destroy 189 villages and to destroy everyone in those villages. So at Ketchian, what they did is they took um, the uh, townspeople, about 145, forced them into a barn, and then they lit the barn. There was hay in the barn. And if anyone ran out of the barn, they shot them. 75 of the 145 were children. Today, there's a monument where the barn is. There's a monument where the ashes were of all the dead. And all of the, many of the names of the children are listed. Can you even imagine the devastation? But you know, there are other times when a city is destroyed because of the direct judgment of God. I think, for example, of the instances I mentioned, natural disasters and war, we could refer to those often as undeserved judgments. But when you get to Jerusalem in 586 BC, that is a deserved judgment predicted by God. And it wasn't God just acting randomly from our standpoint. God was fulfilling his holy word. And if I might say it plainly, Jerusalem was getting exactly what it deserved. Now, for example, Jeremiah was preaching things like this. Listen to his words. O oh, Jerusalem, wash your heart from evil that you may be saved. How long shall your wicked thoughts lodge within you? For a voice declares from Dan and proclaims trouble from Mount Ephraim. Warn the nations that he is coming. Announce to Jerusalem, besiegers come from a distant land. They shout against the cities of Judah like keepers of a field. They are against her all around because she has rebelled against me, declares the Lord. God is speaking. Your ways and your deeds have brought this upon you. This is your doom, and it is bitter. It has reached your very heart. Deserved judgment. And, of course, you know what happened. The last message I mentioned, the Babylonians came, destroyed the city, burned the city, took about 15,000 to Babylon, and you have huge starvation along the way. The suffering was unbelievable, all deserved. Wow. Which leads me to the book of Lamentations. The book of Lamentations, and I want you to take your Bibles and turn to it. Would you turn, please, to the book of Lamentations? It comes after the book of Jeremiah. And it's important for you to have a Bible in your hands. You know, there are some Christians who come to church without their Bibles. I have learned to love them because of the fact that 
Many of them are my friends, and I've learned to love people whom I do not understand, all right? So I love you, and you have to love me, even though I'm going to needle you a little bit about not bringing your Bible if you didn't. But if you bring your Bible regularly, you say, Pastor Luther, I always do. But today, I happen to forget it. Then you can find it there if you can find a pew Bible on page 685, all right? Because you need the Bible in your hand. And the book of Lamentations is the book that we are looking at because Lamentations is five funeral dirges. It is elegies, that is to say, songs composed in a graveyard. The book of Lamentations exposes the heart of Jeremiah and the heart of God as he looks at this devastated city. Somebody has said that the book of Lamentations is really a cloudburst of grief. It is an ocean of sobs and a river of tears. We'll get to it in a moment. Your Bibles are open. Notice that uh, the chapters, um, except the middle chapter, all have 22 verses. Chapter 1, 22 verses. Chapter 2, 22 verses. Chapter 3 happens to have 66. Chapter 4, 22, 5, 22. What's going on there in the text? In Hebrew, it is actually an acrostic. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and each of these verses in the four of the chapters refers and begins with another letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, in the case of the middle chapter, chapter 3, what you have is, I understand that the letters of the alphabet are again used, but in each instance, there are three verses connected to one letter. So 3 times 22 is 66, and that gives you a bit of an outline of the book. I want you to understand that because Lamentations wasn't just Jeremiah uh, walking through the city making random comments. It was really a poem composed of these five different laments, laments. It was composed by him very carefully so that it could be used in liturgical worship, so that the Jews were able to use it. They use it today at the Wailing Wall. They use it on special occasions when they lament the destruction of Jerusalem and their history. Also, it reminds us that God's destruction is from A to Z, as we say, from the beginning of the alphabet to the last of the alphabet. Now, I'm only going to introduce you to the first two chapters, and then we're going to make some observations, and I'm going to be giving you hope. But what chapters they are. Let me read a few verses of chapter 1. How lonely sits the city. First of all, I have to comment before I say that. I want you to visualize the city. Visualize the devastation that takes place, not only when there's a tornado, but when there's a fire that burns the city. So there you can see some of the dolls that the girls played with, and you can see the toys that the boys had. And they're all gone, they're all destroyed, they're all either dead or with their, with their moms and dads on the way to Babylon. Visualize your area. Visualize also the devastation that you are going through. Some of you may say, this is the story of my life. If you're saying that, remember, I am going to give you hope, but I want you to enter into what Jeremiah is saying and seeing. He's weeping not only of what happened, but the good that could have been. Wow. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow she has become, she who was great among the nations. Verse 2, she weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. All of her friends have dealt tre treacherously with her. They become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile because of affliction and hard servitude. She now dwells among the nations, but finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. I'm skipping to verse 9. Her uncleanness was in her skirts. That is to say, she was filled with immorality. She took no thought of her future. Isn't that America today? She took no thought of her future, therefore her fall is terrible. She has no comforter. Oh, Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. 
The enemy has stretched out his hands all over her precious things, for she has seen the nations enter her sanctuary, those whom you forbid to enter your congregation. What's going on there? Israel thought to itself, Judah thought to itself, we have Jerusalem and the temple, and this is where the glory of God once came. There's no way that God is going to destroy us. We are his chosen people. We have God blessed Jerusalem as stickers on the back of every one of our chariots. There's no way that God is going to destroy us. God says, foreigners have entered into your sanctuary your temple is gone, your temple is destroyed, you're going to have to learn to live without the temple. We'll find out what that is like in a future message. Verse 11, all her people groan as they search for bread. They made their treasures for food to revive their strength. Oh, Lord, look and see, for I am despised. Now, that's verses 1 to 11. When you get to verse 12, Jeremiah now personifies the city. It is as if the city is speaking. Is it nothing to you, all those who pass by, look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger? And on it goes. Let me uh, read a few other verses. Let's go to verse 16. For these things I weep, my eyes flow with tears, for comfort is far from me. There's no one to revive my spirit. My children are desolate, for the enemy prevailed. Verse 19, I called to all my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and elders perished in the city while they sought food to revive their strength. You'll notice what the priests and the false prophets were doing. If you can glance quickly to 2.14, your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They have not exposed your iniquity to restore your fortunes, but have seen for you oracles that are false and misleading. I preached about false prophets. All kinds of visions, you know, of happiness and money and wealth, but no exposure of sin. Wow. When you get to chapter 2, what you find is here that God over and over again takes personal responsibility for what happened, for the destruction. Chapter 2, verse 1, how the Lord in his anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. Verse 2, the Lord has swallowed up without mercy all the inhabitants of Jacob. Verse 3, he has cut down his fierce anger. And in the midst of these verses, it keeps saying, he did this, he did this. Verse 4, he has bent his bow like an enemy. Verse 5, the Lord has become like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. Verse 6, he laid waste more than 30 times in this chapter. God says, I did it. Wow. You'll notice what Jeremiah says now in verse 11. My eyes are spent with weeping, my stomach churns, my bile is poured out to the ground because of the destruction of the daughter of my people, because infants and babies faint in the streets of the city. They cry to their mothers, where is bread and wine? And they faint like a wounded man in the streets of the city as their life is poured out on their mother's bosom. My mom and dad lived through World War I. They were Germans, but they were living in the Ukraine. And my mother once turned away with tears in her eyes and told me what it was like to see a baby die because of starvation and hunger. And how would they cry and cry and cry, but there was no food even if the parents were there. There was nothing to drink, and eventually it would be a whimper and then they would cry no more. And that, of course, is happening even around the world today because of starvation and hunger. God says, this is what I did because, you know what? I hate sin and I hate your idolatry. This takes my breath away. Verse 12. Oh, yes, I read that. They cry to their mothers, where is the bread and wine? And there is none, and they die. Now, in chapter 3, he goes on to talk about his own sorrow, and there's much there also that reiterates it. But what I want to do is to take and just back off a little bit and ask ourselves the question, what does this book mean for us? I mean, where does this take us as a congregation, as a church, as a nation? So I'd like to leave some lessons with you 
and then refer to the text again in a few moments. First of all, it's very clear that God can bless a nation, but God can also destroy a nation. God said to Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 11, Behold, I put before you both blessings and cursing. Follow me and you get blessing. If not, follow me and you will be destroyed. In fact, Deuteronomy 28 talks about all this. Everything that happened is foreshadowed in Deuteronomy 28. There are scholars who have taken Deuteronomy 28, the judgments that God promised, and they have put them up against the book of Lamentations and they've seen the parallels. God says, you have a choice. You know, after 9-11, God was brought off the reservation and it was okay to say, God bless you in the public square. Even our Congress together jointly, I think if I remember correctly, sang God bless America of all things, uh, you know, in, in the public square. Uh, God bless America signs were everywhere. In fact, there was a God bless America sign on a porn shop in uh, Nashville. Everybody, well, of course we're better than they are. God can bless America. Now, after he was used to kind of mop up, after 9-11, God was uh, put back on a shelf and said, uh, you can't intrude in the so-called public square. What makes us think that God can only bless America? God may also judge America, and the day may come I hope I don't see it. I hope your children don't see it. When God can, if he wishes, to destroy America. Because God says, if I don't have your heart, God bless America stickers as bumper stickers simply will not work. I mean, I look at this and I'm incredulous. I mean, God, these are your people. You chose them. I mean, this is Jerusalem where you put your glory. I mean, don't you remember the Shekinah glory coming after Solomon built the temple? God says, it doesn't mean a thing to you. Excuse me. God says, it doesn't mean a thing to me if I don't have your heart. That's what God says. So God can bless us. I don't pray for justice for America. I do pray for mercy because we have turned away from so much light. And we continue to do so very deliberately. And I could give you lots of evidence for that, but I assume that you know what is happening in uh, the world and in our government and so forth. Secondly, God has various forms of judgment. God has various forms of judgment. You know, you think back to Adam and Eve. They had specific judgments, didn't they? Uh, God says you can't go back into paradise, and so he puts up the cherubim to make sure that that wouldn't happen. And then, uh, lo and behold, sin enters into the world, and they have the first very, very dysfunctional family. And uh, Cain kills Abel, so they've got a problem with one of their sons, and uh, the whole history of the human race since. So there are some immediate judgments, and then you think of the way in which the judgments begin to boomerang all throughout history. You know, there's such a thing as sin having immediate judgments. And some of you know about that, don't you? Yesterday, Rebecca and I were talking about someone who was hooked on drugs and how eventually they were found dead. And, and you know, there are immediate judgments, you know, and, and God says, I'll rescue you. Behold, I put before you as individuals both blessings and cursings. Some of you have to choose God and to choose that which is right because you have understood the unintended consequences of sin are very bad and they have long-term effects immediately and then long-term effects. And sometimes God destroys a civilization or a city like he destroyed Jerusalem and sometimes that destruction is internal as is happening in America today with the destruction of our families and with the rise of hostility toward the Christian message, there's no doubt that we are under some kind of a judgment. We are to be a people of God in a nation that clearly has lost its way. You know, when I read this, and I read the book of Lamentations a couple of times in the last few weeks, I think to myself, wow, if God is willing to do this to Jerusalem, the city that he loved, it says in the Psalms, you know, Zion is the place where I've put my name, and I love Zion. 
Oh, really? Well, it doesn't seem as if there's a lot of love lost here, but if God is willing to do that temporally in this life, I read this book and I say, what must hell be like? God has various judgments, but beware, you as an individual, I talk both as a nation today, but also you as an individual, that sin has immediate judgments always, and sometimes they accumulate to something very, very catastrophic. There's another lesson, and that is this. I'm just sharing my heart with you today that we should weep over our nation even as Jeremiah wept over his nation. I told you last time that there were many prophets in Israel, but there was only one Jeremiah, and he's known as the weeping prophet. And all throughout this book and throughout his book of Jeremiah, what is he doing? He is weeping. Now he's being thrown into a dungeon and the whole bit because the people are saying, we don't want to hear you. And so he pretty well has to stand for truth alone. But he's a weeping prophet. Doesn't that remind you of someone else standing on the Mount of Olives? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou who killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto you, how often would I have gathered your children together even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings. But you wouldn't. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Bible says in the book of Luke that Jesus Christ wept over the city. And when he wept over the city, he predicted its demise and its downfall. And uh, this is what he said. Would that you, even you, had known this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barrier around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not know the day of your visitation. And the same thing that happened in 586 B.C., as you well know, happened in 70 A.D. when Titus came. After Saul, excuse me, after Herod builds that massive temple that all of us were, wish were still standing so that we could go see it when we take a trip to Jerusalem. Six years after it was totally completed, completed in 64 A.D., I believe it was, destroyed six years later. God says, you don't love me, you don't accept me, your heart is not with me. I'll destroy even the very place dedicated to my name. We should weep over the violence of the city. We should weep over divorce. We should weep over pornography. We should weep over child abuse. We should weep over the destruction of the family, as we saw it here in, in Illinois, further adding to the destruction of the family just recently through same-sex marriage legislation. We should weep over the growing hostility. You see, we are too self-absorbed sometimes to weep, aren't we? You know, like Francis Schaeffer used to tell us, the, only, the average American uh, is content with um, personal peace and affluence. Just not in my world, not in my neighborhood, thank you very much. But it can happen somewhere else. God may in this congregation be looking for a lot of Jeremiah's, both men and women, to intercede and to weep for a nation that has lost its way, and not only weep and pray, but witness and do something wherever God has planted us. May that be true. But number four, we should weep with hope. We should weep with hope. I told you that we were getting to hope. You have to trust me. We are getting to hope. Look at in chapter 3. Jeremiah is so overcome by his sorrow that he says in verse 17, My soul is bereft of peace. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you parked your car in the parking lot of Moody Church and you dried your tears and you came to worship and after this service you're going to go back into the car and you're going to start crying again. 
If that's you, just know that you are welcome here because we are a place where we are welcoming to all sinners. And uh, God knows that that's what we're about. But he says, my soul, and I'm not saying that that is a sin necessarily to weep. I just mean that we here at the congregation of Moody Church are welcoming to all. I have forgotten what happiness is, verse 17. So I say, my endurance has perished. So is my hope from the Lord. Maybe you're here today and that's you. Ah, remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. Verse 20, my soul continues to remember it and is bowed down within me. Verse 21, oh, thank you, Jeremiah. I needed this. I remembered something. This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. He is good that one should, it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. In other words, Jeremiah says, I was so overcome by grief that for a while I forgot that God was there. And then he says this, the steadfast love of the Lord is still there. The Hebrew word is hesed. It means God's covenant loyal love is still in place. Uh, does this mean that uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, that God has, uh, is through with the Jews and says, enough already? No. In fact, later on, we'll discover that it was Jeremiah himself who predicted that they would be in Babylon for 70 years. At the end of 70 years, they'd return, they would rebuild the temple, and God would, in effect, start over again. And eventually, of course, you know, the Jewish people, they're in the land today, many of them, and many of us believe that God still has a great future for a remnant of the people of Israel, the Jews. And, and God says, I'm not going to break my covenant over this. You know what the Bible says in Timothy? It says, even when we believe not, he cannot deny himself. God is faithful. Today you may be in darkness, but I'm reminded of the disciples out in the boat. You remember Jesus went into the mountain to pray, and the disciples couldn't see Jesus, but Jesus could see them. He could see the longitude and the latitude of their little boat. He, could, he knew the strength of the waves. He knew the strength of each board. He knew the depth of the water. And today, in your distress, God sees you, and I encourage you to take heart in the steadfast love of the Lord, which never ceases. And why are his mercies new every morning? Well, it's because when you wake up in the morning, there has to be enough strength to get through the day. And your day may be very dark, and you may be sorrowful because of uh, your own loss or the country's loss, as we've been speaking about our country. And uh, what we need to do is, when we wake up in the morning, we need to say, God, I, I need your mercies today. They have to be new to me. Because yesterday's mercies don't help me through today. So Jeremiah said, you know, for a few moments, I just forgot that I can still find hope in God. And he uses the word hope now positively two or three times in this passage. Furthermore, he says, it is good for people to wait on God. The soul he seeks to seeks him, God is good to that person, he says. And so what Jeremiah does is he encourages us in God that in the midst of devastation, no matter what happens to America, and I hope that everything that happens to America is good, I'm not a prophet, so I'm not predicting anything except the fact that what I see happening gives me a great deal of consternation. But apart from that, um, the Bible says, uh, those who seek God, those who understand his mercies, God will be for their God will be there for them every single day. Aren't you glad for that? Now, before we close this book, we have to take one more glance over our shoulder 
and ask a question. If it is true that Jerusalem took a direct hit, by that I mean what happened to them was a direct judgment of God, if that is true, and clearly it seems to me that it is, where else do we see anyone or anything or any city or where else do we see a direct hit of the judgment of God? Well, look at here this book. I'm in chapter 1, verse 12. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. Doesn't that remind you of Jesus on the cross? And um, think, for example, of chapter 2, verse 15. All who pass along the way, clap their hands at you, they hiss and they wag their heads at the daughters of Jerusalem. That's an expression used in the book of Mark for all those who looked at the crucifixion of Jesus. They clapped their hands, they hissed, they wagged their heads. They said he's dying, but he deserves it. Look, for example, of um, chapter 3, verse 14. Doesn't this sound like what Jesus endured. I have become the laughingstock of all the peoples, the object of all their taunts all day long. Looks like Jesus endured that. The fact is this, that when Jesus died on the cross, he took a direct hit. God says, I'm going to lay upon him the iniquity of all who believe. I am going to inflict in it. And that's why the Bible says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. I hope that your theology is great enough to accept the fact that God took responsibility for the destruction of Jerusalem, and actually, God also takes responsibility for the crucifixion of Jesus, ultimately, though evil people do it, yet because of secondary causality, ultimately, God says, even Babylon is my Babylon, and the wicked men who crucified Jesus are my wicked men. Doesn't mean that he condones what they have done, but he uses what they have done to accomplish his purpose. Now, young people, you'll discover this on the internet. There will be things like this and saying, you know, Christianity is just like all the other religions of the world. You know, they have this God who needs a sacrifice. And so they'll, they'll go into the pagan religions and explain to you how God needs a sacrifice and how pagan religions also needed a sacrifice. Here's something for you to remember, though. While it's true that pagan religions needed a sacrifice, there is no pagan religion in all the world where God demanded a sacrifice and ended up being the sacrifice. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And Jesus said, I will take the direct hit of the wrath of God against sin, I will take your hell. If you believe on me, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. In the Old Testament, Jerusalem took a direct hit from God's wrath and anger. In the New Testament, Jesus takes that direct hit when he cries out and says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then for three hours suffers under the hand of God a kind of suffering that is so severe that even God closed the heavens and darkness was upon the face of the earth so that people would know that what was happening between him and his father was hidden from the human eye. But this is what it means. It means that no matter how great your sin is, you believe on Jesus Christ, you're exempt from eternal judgment. No matter how deep the pit is that you are in, God is deeper still. And no matter how much you mourn, there are still mercies for you that are new every morning if you come to Jesus Christ and believe on him. Even if we do go through temporal judgments, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ. 
He, Jesus said, he who believes in me, there is no condemnation. As a hymn writer once put it, because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look at him and pardon me. That pardon is offered to you today. Behold, I put before you blessings and cursings. Will you respond to Jesus today? And then we can all sing together, the mercies of the Lord never cease. In fact, they are new every morning. And I have to find the text to remember the words. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion. In the midst of devastation, God comes to bless and encourage his own people. But do you know the Savior? I'm talking to those of you who, who are here today, and, and you have huge problems. You maybe came to this church even unintentionally today. But here you are. In the midst of your sorrow, God is there through Jesus to pardon you and to set you free. Could we join together as we pray? And if God has talked to you, even where you are seated or where you're listening to this, you may be listening on the internet or on the radio, whatever way, would you just stop now and say, Jesus, I thank you today that you absorbed the judgment of God so that I could be free. And I receive that gift of eternal life. I put my faith and trust in you as my Savior. Would you tell him that? And now, Father, we thank you that your mercies never cease. In Jesus' name, amen.